Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. Today we're going to talk about one of the greatest producers of all time, Mr. Jack Douglas. Hi there, if you haven't already, please subscribe, hit the like button, and of course you can go to Produce Like a Pro and sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. Now, without a doubt, Jack Douglas is one of the most successful producers that has ever lived. Albums such as Toys in the Attic, Rocks, and Double Fantasy alone are some of the biggest selling, most artistically acclaimed, and arguably best sounding records of all time. They've influenced so many of us. His credits are massive. As an engineer and a producer, he's worked with John Lennon on the Imagine album, and as a producer, of course, he worked on Double Fantasy and Milk and Honey. Sometime New York City, John Lennon and Yoko Ono with the Plastic Ono Band. With Aerosmith, he did Get Your Wings, Toys in the Attic, Rocks, Draw the Line, the live bootleg album, Rock in a Hard Place, Alice Cooper, Billion Dollar Babies, Muscle of Love, the first New York Dolls record, Yoko Ono's solo albums, Radio Ethiopia with Patti Smith. He did the Blue Oyster Cult album, On Your Feet or On Your Knees. He did Montrose's album, Jump On It. He's worked with Cheap Trick on many albums. Of course, one of those is Live at the Budokan. He got to work with one of his heroes, George Martin on the amazing Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band record to go along with the movie where he got to work with Aerosmith, of course, doing that incredible cover of Come Together. He did a solo album with Joe Perry, Let the Music Do the Talking. Another short term, but ex-member of Aerosmith, Rick Dufay with Tender Loving Abuse. Michael Schenker, Rock Will Never Die, the live album. The Knack. This is a basic overview of Jack's albums. I personally have worked with Jack as an engineer. And one of the most important things that I learned with working with Jack is humility and inclusiveness. He allows everybody in the room, every member of the band, to have an opinion. He doesn't pick favorites. He doesn't listen to only one person. He makes the environment completely and utterly safe for creativity to flourish. His relationships are huge. He has continued to work with Aerosmith over decades. He did the last Aerosmith record nearly 40 years after doing the first one. He worked with John Lennon all the way from Imagine right up until his untimely death. And of course, is one of the last people to see John Lennon alive. Jack Douglas discovered Cheap Trick in a bowling alley and got them signed. Here at their Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction, they thank Jack specifically. Who knew? Who knew? We didn't know. Uh, thanks to Jack Douglas that's here with my other two kids, Robin Saylor and Robin Taylor. Thanks to Jack, we were given the chance to prove that the world we thought all what we thought we were all along in this world is that was we were the best fucking rock band your town has ever seen. We uh, we were turned down by countless labels, and then one night in the middle of the winter in Waukesha, Wisconsin, at the Sunset Bowling Alley, <laughs> Sir Jack Douglas saw our group and agreed to produce our first album if we secured a record deal. Jack at the time was the most successful producer in rock and his endorsement of us led immediately to a bidding war from record labels. Jack, we're forever indebted to you and we love you. You got them signed though, didn't you? You saw them I did. play a show. I saw them playing in a bowling alley in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And they absolutely blew, I mean, I had heard of them, but I was with my brother-in-law who took me to, to see this band, uh, he had the worst taste in music. <laughs> so I was reluctant until he told me who, who it was. And I said, I've you know, heard of them. And, uh, and they were playing in a bowling alley lounge and the place was packed to the rafters. And their show, I mean, had all this great material already and went into their van after their bus, that they had a touring bus. 
that they had. It was, you know, a tiny little thing. And I said, God, you know, I introduced them myself, and I said, I love you guys. And I really want, and they were doing like a weekend, the whole, you know, you would do Thursday through Sunday, I guess. And, um, and I said, I'm going to get you guys signed, and we're going to make a record together. And they were like, great, let's do it. And I called up uh, Tom Orman, who was head of a and at Epic, and I said, if you don't get out here right away, like right away, I'm taking him to RCA, and it, this band is amazing. And I had, you know, I had a pretty good track record, so he took my word for it, and he came out, and he fell in love with them, and they were signed in probably two weeks. Beautiful. To a shitty contract that they regretted forever. But, you know, in the beginning, you sign. But that got worked out recently, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Yeah. It did. What but, are you telling um, me about that? I, I, can, I can vouch that for the fact that my, myself, I was signed to um, Bell Records, Columbia, and Epic at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> with different names, with a different, <laughs> a different group. Once again, it was the 70s. Yes, <laughs> it was uh, the Wild West. Wild that West. was the 60s. Oh, that was the 60s? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was actually signed to, to three labels at the same time. Of course, you have Jack Douglas, John Douglas. John Douglas, and the Swamp Seeds. And the Swamp Seeds. Yeah. He's a man who has the respect of so many people. Hanging around him on a daily basis is one of the most exciting things you can do because his friends are some of the most influential and most importantly, the most creative people in the world. Jack's journey, though, was very, very interesting. He's told me many, many stories of how he got into this business. As a young musician in the mid-60s, Jack and a bandmate, Edward Leonetti, were, like everybody in the world, completely and utterly obsessed with the Beatles. So in November 1965, the pair decided to head straight to the source of the music that helped inspire them. Of course, that was Liverpool in England. They wanted to meet the Beatles, and they had, of course, the intention of playing some gigs of their own and breaking out from Liverpool. As Jack recalls, the cheapest means of travel at the time was by tramp steamer, which he and Leonetti boarded as the sole passengers with a one-way ticket. It took nearly three weeks, but the two eventually arrived in Liverpool, carrying only their guitars and amplifiers and small suitcases. They didn't have any work visas, of course, or any kind of permit to do this in Liverpool. And after arriving, were almost immediately detained by immigration officials on board the ship. The story goes that one of the sailors goes to a bar one night, gets a little drunk, and is sitting next to a journalist from the Liverpool Echo. The journalist told his editor, and they arranged a media spread sensationalising the story about two young Americans who were being held captive on a ship in Liverpool. Immigration officials finally granted them student visas, so the duo did get to spend some time in Liverpool. They went to the Cavern Club, they bought some records, but of course the Beatles at that stage were living in London. They achieved quite a lot of notoriety in England due to the Liverpool Echo story and the papers started calling them the Crazy Hanks. They even shared some front page space next to the Beatles who had just put out a new album. But their time was up, however, and they were detained and deported back to the United States after being caught playing in a band. So years later, it's 1971, and the Imagine sessions are going on in the record plant. Jack is sitting in a room doing some tape transfers, and then there's a knock on the door. And John Lennon comes in and asks Jack if he'll do some transfers. He says, do you mind if I just sit here for a little bit while you transfer my demos to cassette? Jack's sat there completely nervous. There's this hero sitting behind him. And he sheepishly and awkwardly says, after about 10 or 15 minutes, you know, I've uh, been to Liverpool. John says, oh, you've been to Liverpool? And he's like, yeah, you know, me and my friend, uh, we uh, stowed away on this uh, um, tramp steamer um, back in 65. And he started telling the story. And he was, wasn't even halfway through telling the story. And Jack told me that John burst into laughter and was like, what, you were one of those crazy Yanks that stowed away thinking you would meet us in Liverpool and all this kind of stuff. So apparently, even though the Beatles were now, by late 1965, living in London, 
they still got the local Liverpool papers. They were Liverpool boys and they got these papers and they would follow what was going on at home. And of course, they saw the story with Jack and his friend, you know, and they just thought it was hilarious. They thought it was cool, but they also thought it was hilarious. So John immediately takes a liking to Jack, which if you know Jack is not hard to do. He's incredibly amiable. But here he was, you know, sharing something that resonated with John, something he had remembered. So John pulls Jack into the recording session for Imagine and says to Roy Sakala, I like this guy. Let's give him something to do. And so Jack ends up working on Imagine. And I do remember Jack saying to me that, you know, he's pulling him in. John's pulling Jack Douglas, you know, the kid, you know, he's what, early 20s or something like that, pulling him into the studio. And he's saying, you know, this, this, I like this kid, he should be working. And he said, Sakala gave him that look of like, what are you doing in here? And if I think about that story when Jack told me it, I was thinking to myself, that is a break, isn't it? You get on a steamer, you travel halfway across the world to maybe play some shows in Liverpool, maybe get discovered, go to the Cavern Club, buy some records in England that maybe you couldn't get in America, and most importantly, try and meet the Beatles. And that's in 65. And now flash forward six years later, five and a half, six years later, and he's working as a janitor, an assistant, and doing all the lowest jobs, possibly for a couple of years by this point, in the record plant. And just by chance, he gets to do a tape transfer, sits there awkwardly for a few minutes, relays the story to John Lennon, and it just resonates with John Lennon. I mean, imagine being in John Lennon's position and hearing that story. Of course, you'd be like, wow, I remember you. You made so much effort to come and meet me. Here we are. This is destined to be. That's a lot of work. It's a long five or six years and a lot of work to get to that point, but it paid off. That was the beginning of a very close working relationship that Jack had with John Lennon. I remember Jack telling me about the first demos that he heard from John Lennon for Double Fantasy. And at that point, I don't believe John Lennon had recorded or done anything in about three or four years. He had been completely out of the spotlight, which if you think about it in these terms for a Beatle, for one of the four most famous musicians in the whole world, arguably four of the most famous musicians that ever lived, you know, with Elvis and a couple of others, of course. It was a big deal. And, and he said that John sent him, like, cassette demos. This really sums up why Jack is Jack Douglas and why he's so successful. He sent me a, a cassette from, uh, from Bermuda, which Yoko gave to me. It was in an envelope that said, for Jack's ears only. It had a lot of songs on it, some still not heard. And I took it home and he, and he said to me, um, I'm going to call you tomorrow and tell me what you think of these songs because he didn't think much of them. He, he was very insecure about whether he could still write a song. And he was, had been down in Bermuda. They were, I listened to them. They're very primitive. He was singing into a Panasonic uh, beatbox. Just, yeah singing into that, and then uh, playing off of that into another beatbox and double tracking his vocal. Two and, cassette players. Yeah. Uh, you know, and no, no wire, just the playing and the mic, that was it. And, and then doubling his vocal or singing a little. I was doing that me. in 82, so yeah. I, was, I was a bit behind him. And then, <laughs> and then he would be, you know, he would add some other guitar part or something else to it as it went over. So it was that primitive. And he called me up and he said, well, what do you think of these songs? And I told him, just put out this cassette. You don't need me. I can't beat it. You know, it, they're, they're just, it's an incredible statement. They're, the songs are beautiful. Does that cassette still exist? Yes. Two cassettes, actually. And they were all narrated. He would say something before the song and something after it. That was usually pretty funny. I told him that. So he says, I'm taking that to mean that you think the songs are good. And I said, I said, take it to mean that you should just release this cassette. <laughs> that just speaks to J Jack's personality because I, I frankly think he meant it. He didn't say it to be sort of like ingratiate himself. Oh, no, you don't need me. I've heard people say those kind of things all the time. But I know Jack. And he's being honest. You listen to those demos. I bet they are unbelievable. They'll probably bring you to tears. You've heard the demos in the anthology. 
You hear some of those. You hear what Free, Free as a Bird, for instance, and how they did the overdubs on that. Jack recently worked on a track uh, for Ringo Starr, Paul McCartney played bass on, and I believe there's even a cameo from George Harrison on, that um, John Lennon wrote for him. John Lennon wrote this for Ringo Starr. The song Grow Old With Me became an emotional centerpiece of Ringo's last album. I know that Ringo talks about, in many interviews, about being brought to tears from me, hearing that. And I believe on the tape, it says this one's for Ringo. Can you imagine? 40 years later, somebody gives you a cassette and says this song was written for you. And that person who's been dead for 40 years is like, this one's for you. I mean, in this world that we live in with uh, modern technology and the way we communicate with each other and how things, you know, digitized and sent around, just knowing that music exists in, in cassettes that used to be sent through the mail, you know, to each other, and then you listen to it. So you'd send it, wait three days for somebody to get it, and then you'd call them and see if they'd listened to it yet or even received it yet, you know. The way that music used to be made um, is quite remarkable because you couldn't just send something by an MP3 and go, what do you think? Oh, change it to a G minor. You know, there was a time for things to marinate. And there's not really an accident that when you put on an album like Double Fantasy, for instance, you get to hear songs like Watching the Wheels, talking about, you know, his period where he wasn't working. I'm just sitting here watching the wheels go round and round. Or starting over is actually about his relationship. But again, probably the ambiguity speaks about coming back. There's just so many songs on that record done by an artist coming back after a period of three to four years of, of just sort of disappearing from public life. And it speaks volumes to Jack Douglas and his personality. And I can tell you as an engineer, let alone a producer, but as an engineer, having a producer like that in the room is worth millions of dollars. Somebody who's had those experiences, has worked with the biggest of the biggest, the, more importantly, forget big, best of the best. Forget the success in the monetary terms. The creativity of an artist like John Lennon, Aerosmith, Cheap Trick, you know, all of these names of these great artists. It's worth its weight in gold because you're going to have a pair of ears and a sensibility that knows how to craft great performances. And I've seen it in action. I've seen the way Jack interacts with people. I see the way he interacts with me, how he brings things out of me and challenges me without ever making me feel overwhelmed. And I see him do it with Steven Tyler and Joey Kramer and... Joe Perry and Brad Whitford and, of course, Tom and all of those guys. And, and it's, it's miraculous and it brings the best out of people. He made Double Fantasy in almost complete and utter secrecy. Only a handful of people knew. He said, OK, so we're going to make a record. Here, here's, uh, here's the thing. No one can know we're making this record because I'm not sure this is going to go so well. And I, the last thing I want is the press to know that I attempted a comeback and couldn't do it. I said, by no one, you mean no one? No one. He said, absolutely no one. He said, you, uh, I'll meet you at the Dakota and we'll go over all the perimeters. It speaks to a trust factor. And I think that that's very, very important when it comes to working with artists, that you can have those kind of relationships. Lennon's honesty and openness with Jack was definitely representative of their relationship. Lennon was very aware of the types of records that Jack made and had words of caution, though, for Jack in this respect. He also said to me, and this was like a real warning to me, he said, look, I know how hard you like to rock. This isn't about that. Back it up. Back it up. He said, this is a song. This album is a guy that's about to turn 40. You know, I'm not making believe that I'm a rocker. I want it to be a contemporary statement of where I am right now. So throttle back on the rock. No Aerosmith on this one. No, no Aerosmith. And uh, I mean, he was well aware of everything that I did. He was, he knew, you know, he followed my career. There's a line that Jack has said to me that you can read online that I absolutely love about John Lennon. I just want to stop and talk about that. I said to Jack once on a car ride. So sorry, Jack, I know, you, but I know you've said this to many people. I said, what's the most important thing you learned from working with John Lennon? And he said, tell the truth and make it rhyme. 
And I think however you want to view that, what it's basically saying is make it honest. Be an honest artist and make sure that it's good enough, hooky enough for people to actually want to listen to it. And I take that as a really powerful statement indictment of music because it's easy sometimes to be super artistic. And sometimes it's really easy to be super hooky and pop. But if you heard me talk about many, many times, there's that little tiny piece where it crosses over. And if you can do both, that's the secret. And of course, John Lennon and the Beatles, one of those few artists that could do that. When I asked him what else he said, he said, if you make a mistake, make it louder. <laughs> They'll think I did it on purpose. I love that. It's almost a jazz thing, isn't it? You know, play, play the note wrong and then play it wrong again. Then people think he did it on purpose. So I've been blessed to engineer for Jack Douglas and mix many things that he's done. I've recorded with him. But I remember he said to me, when we were making the last Aerosmith record, he said to me, he goes, Jameson is going to come by today. And I went, wow, a real engineer, Jameson. Now that is a guy that you have to know about. What an incredible engineer. Jay was the engineer on so many of these records, particularly, of course, the Aerosmith records. He actually wasn't the engineer on Double Fantasy. I think he was booked on something else. But all of those classic drum sounds and guitar sounds from rocks, I mean, and Toys in the Attic, you know, the sound of that Strat through the Fender ramp, you know. Da -da 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 -da. That's all Jay. Jay, Jay is a world-class engineer. His resume is insane. So the great thing is, I must say, is that they have reunited and they've been making quite a few records recently. If you want your album mixed and mastered or produced and engineered, I can't think of a better combination of talent than those two guys. So if you are interested, you're an artist, if it's one song, a whole album, I've been blessed to work with Jack on some of the biggest artists in the world. Aerosmith is a great example, but also we've done a lot of independent artists as well. And so to see that now there's an opportunity to work not only with Jack, but with Jack and Jay Messina. If you are an artist looking for some production work, I can't think of anything better than working with those two. So thank you ever so much for watching. I'm going to do more of these because I've been blessed to work with so many incredible producers as an engineer and learn so much that we'll do more of these videos. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Check out Jay and Jack's page. They've got uh, information if you want to work with them, work with them. Highly recommend it. Just to have a song mixed by those guys would be life changing. I mean, incredible. Have a marvellous time recording and mixing. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Thank you ever so much for watching. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and notifications bell. And we'll speak to you all again very soon. Thanks ever so much. Mm -hmm.